Hello. So I was going to say it was really nice to connect with you all today. And it's just really wonderful to be to plug into the queer energy in person and just being around you all. It's just uh, it's just reviving um, and energy in my system. So thank you for all for being here. And Dominic, thank you for inviting me. And today I'm going to talk about this program that we did that aired in 2019 called Sex on the Couch. And it was uh, basically working with real life couples with sex problems. And we had four therapists. Is Kate Moll, who is in the room today. Love you, Kate. And um, basically it was the, the, the concept was very much educational, but it was also uh, therapeutic. So couples came, real couples, we did not really know what their issues were. They were kind of screened by psychologists before they came to us. So because we wanted, really wanted to have no script to really be looking like it was real sessions when people come and we don't know them and we're getting to know them in the process. It was three sessions, one session a week. And, um, and it was really kind of, uh, focused on, on on sexual problems. It was for everybody. It was not just for queer people. So we had couples of all sexual orientations. My ones, I had uh, one couple who was a black lesbian couple with uh, kink, uh, wanting to talk about kink and explore kink. And my other couple was um, a, a young uh, gay male couples who grappled with monogamy and their eroticism. And it was just really wonderful to, to be there on screen uh, to, to work with them. The only thing that really for me was difficult was that my first session was scheduled at 8 a.m. And um, Brendan talking about the public and private part of self, that 8 a.m. self is not for public viewing. <laughs> but I was there. And also there was no makeup artist. <laughs> so it was, but apart from that, <laughs> it was all right. <laughs> the good thing about doing that, though, was that um, the, what we got, the response that we got was actually really quite overwhelming. We got lots of different responses from this program. It was six episodes, on one hour episode for six weeks, so it was quite a, quite a lot of screen time, really, for a program about sex. And um, even now, even though it was in 2019, even now I still get emails and texts from people saying, the show was really great because it just really normalized and we talked about normalization it normalized that having a sexual problem is not being broken or it's not full of shame it's actually something that happens to so many couples those are very couples it's just a kind of like a, a normal thing and also to normalize therapy because of course therapy is behind closed nobody really knows what goes on and suddenly we open the doors to the public nationally and people could really see what it was like to have real sex therapy and so uh, the other feedback that we got is that people said actually you know what i think i might just go and see a sex therapist i just didn't want, didn't want, didn't want, didn't want to so it was really wonderful to get that in it and that's really the, the time when i felt wow you know i love my job working one-to-one -one or working with a couple or with relationships but that's just one you, you're helping one person or one couple at a time and this time we could help loads of people. Loads of people could, could benefit from our work on a national scale. And some people even said that they improved their sex lives just by watching the program, just by doing some exercises that we recommended couples. So that was really warm my heart and it was just really wonderful. And that's the big power of media. The other feedback was from uh, colleagues, some, send me an email and said, you know what? I want to train as a sex therapist. You made me want to train as a sex therapist. I'm gonna go into this profession. And that was another thing that was just really wonderful to, to be able to um, encourage our colleagues to want to study sexology, study sex therapy, relationship therapy, because we are in so much demand and there's so much need. And I'm just so glad that we could encourage um, some of you to do that. So this is the kind of, the great joy of media. And if some of you are interested in doing media, please do. I really encourage some of you to, to go there, out there and speak about queerness, about relationship diversity, about sexuality diversity, because we need more voices. And it's really important that we don't become competitive. There's, we can share the light, we can share the stage. There's enough room for all of us and we need more and more voices. So if you are interested, 
um, send me an email and I can, you know, help you and coach you with a little bit of my experience. I'm very happy to encourage some of you to, to go out there and do that if you want. But of course, doing that also means that there is the dark side of media. And I just want to talk a little bit about that because um, when we uh, started the program, one of the first advice from BBC was don't read the comments, right? And of course, I read the comments. <laughs> and um, I was prepared, of course, I was prepared for negative comments because we you know if the advisors don't read the comments, you know what's coming. And so I was kind of going there already with a bit of a protection. But I was actually surprised. What I wasn't prepared for was the intensity of the comments and how people really got out of their ways to throw hate from anonymous accounts without their faces, without their names, but really going really super personal, not just to me or my colleagues, but also to the courageous couples that came on the show. And that's really when kind of like, I felt a bit bruised in terms of my own optimistic thought that I thought that human beings are basically good people. And suddenly I thought, oh gosh, there are some people that just really enjoy hate, you know? And that was quite, um, quite something really, but luckily I had my resources I was trained uh, in emotional regulation, so that didn't really affect me that much. But what I want to say is, if you want to get into the media, really do have plenty of resources for yourself first. One of my main resources actually was you. It was the connection, it was my friends, my colleagues that I could call, that we could talk about it. Connection was just so important to, to kind of uh, heal from, from that stuff. And of course, because I'm Gobi, that didn't stop me. So now, you know, I talk, I talk a lot and I talk about issues like LGBTQ and issues like pornography. And when I don't agree with the narrative, say, for example, porn destroys your brain kind of narrative, I get people really kind of creating email accounts just for me and emailing me and saying, you will burn in hell. And I wish you a slow, painful death. I'm sorry. It's quite incredible how, how far people can go, really, in, in uh, sharing their opinions. So, you know, uh, that's really what I want to say to you. Like, if you want to go out there, if you want to speak about things, if you want to write, blog, podcast, be prepared for what you get back. But at the same time, the benefits that you, that you give to our communities, to, to, the, to the mass media people, is so amazing it's just worth it in my opinion i think it's worth it it's worth it if you really prepare yourself for um you know for, for the hate another thing to think about when you go into mass media is also to be careful what you're going to be choosing to contribute to because a lot of the media and a lot of the storylines are not really seeking to inform the public but they just want to sell headlines and sell stuff with sensations sensation stories some of those are things like wife got killed because she was into bdsm kind of storylines that are quite common or people with unusual fetishes become serial killers or brain porn destroys your brain and those are kind of like storylines that sometimes people will call you the some media companies they will call you and say oh do you want to be an expert on this and do you want to agree with our storylines and you have to really pick up the red flags here because you don't want to be contributing to some misinformation that can actually harm people rather than helping people and the thing is that once you contribute to a media and you do your interview you just don't know how they're going to edit you and so you have to really be careful with that, I think. So make sure that it's really that, that the ethics of the, the media that you're going to contribute to are uh, in the same line, same line as you and, and actually for helping people not, not to create more harm. So um, oh, so that's, that's kind of like it really that I just really wanted to share with you with my experience. But I just wanted to say one more thing is about us as therapists being out there in the media. Sometimes we have to choose um, how we do it as well, because as for me anyway, my, my experience is that if I'm a therapist in a consulting room, who, who am I when I'm in the media? Am I still a therapist when I'm in the media or am I somebody else? Am I an activist? Am I a teacher? Who, who am I? 
And I think we'll have all sorts of different opinions, really. But my opinion is that I'm always a therapist. And what I mean by that is that whatever I say in the media, the first thought I have is my clients will see me. And so I want to be able to say things that is not going to harm them as my priority. So basically, in a nutshell, don't talk about your clients on social media or in the media. Don't talk about the contents of their session, even if they are anonymized. And if you're on, on, on Twitter and, and so on, you know, don't say things like, I had a terrible day today. Because what if, you're, what if your client who had a session with you that day is actually seeing your, your, your tweet about that? So I think we have to be, I think we have to be um, really super careful with what we say and we have to think uh, one step further when we are out there in the, in the media, both for protecting ourselves, but also for protecting our clients. So um, these are kind of my advice. And but obviously, because of the, the dark side, I don't want to put you up. And I think that if you want to go into media, please go for it. And I'll be happy to support you. Thank you. Um, so I'm Lori Beth Bisbee. And um, this year, I participated in the first season of Open House, The Great Sex Experiment. Um, the premise of the show was that we were going to help couples open up who were previously monogamous. Uh, this is a common format for a show these days. It's called edutainment. And one of the things that I think is somewhat different from working on a show like Silva's, which was definitely more focused at education, is that one has to remember that entertainment is a big reason the show is being made. So my... Um, it, it was a cut down version of an, of an actual retreat that I do um, with some additional sauciness added in. Um, the couples basically had um, three to four sessions with me over three days, and they had the opportunity to put into practice some of their desires with some residents that were at the retreat who were consenting and were interested in them. And so what would happen is they would come to the retreat, they would see me, and then they would go and get involved in an activity. Um, some of them wanted a threesome, some of them just got involved in a kind of very light sensual activity. Um, and then they would come back and see me the following day, often um, with a bunch of questions, sometimes with a lot of issues. Um, it was a controversial program because there was non-monogamy and it was also a controversial program because um, it was on channel four at 10 p.m. on a Friday and a lot of the sex was shown. So not a reality show. Nobody was voted off the show and nothing was scripted. Um, and so it was managing what people brought to me, but also managing um, the things that they got up to and managing the, the, the response and the outcome as a result of what they got up to. Uh, the program was well received and I've just finished filming the second season. So last year we had six episodes, this year we had eight, and this year um, it's a lot more psychologically deep because the people who came to be on the program had seen the program, so they had an idea of what we were gonna do. Um, I get a lot of feedback from this. Like um, Silva, I think one of the first things I did was take the advice of um, Firecracker Films in Channel 4, and I did not read um, much of social media. Um, I made a mistake once, um, and the comments were quite scathing. Um, I do think that female presenting people get a different kind of comment than male presenting people do people talk about our appearance. And while I was prepared for all sorts of things, I wasn't prepared for that. Um, so I just stopped reading comments after that. And um, another thing that we were told was don't get engaged. And um, I learned that when somebody says, I have a very honest, genuine question on social media, that means they're trying to set you up. So it was, um, it was a steep learning curve. I 
um, have um, chosen family who actually screened stuff for me so that I would see the positive things and I would see things where I absolutely did need to respond, but that I wouldn't see the negative stuff. Uh, the other thing I think as a um, female presenting person is I was unprepared to be sexualized as a result of being on this program. Um, I'm not sure why um, my common sense should tell me that that might be a possibility, but I guess because I was in the therapist role and I wasn't taking part in any of the sexual activities, I wasn't even around for any of the parties or anything like that. I was very definitely set apart. I did not expect some of what happened, um, including things like um, somebody mining my social media accounts for any pictures of my feet and making a, a web page dedicated to my feet, which has since been taken down. Um, and that was something I hadn't planned for. So I think in, when you are thinking about the impact on you, the therapist who's going to be in the media, one of the things that you need to think about is that you cannot predict the kinds of feedback you might get and how wide ranging that might be and how that might impact your life. On the positive side, um, this program was, a, was challenging because we were talking about different kinds of open relationships. Um, and that was challenging to a lot of people. And yet it was relatable enough that I have had as many referrals from couples who are monogamous seeking to do some work around their relationship and around sex um, as I have had from people wanting to open up their relationship. So I was very pleased with that. My main reason for doing this was wanting to normalize and wanting to let people know that there are choices that we have um, and that there isn't only one relationship style. I, I said on the program more than once and in the media more than once that I'm not pro non-monogamy, I'm pro-choice. And what I wanna see people do is explore what kind of relationship style would work best for them and make an active educated choice as opposed to entering a relationship style because that's how they were brought up. I had a lot of fun with it, but it is very, very hard work to do a television series. Um, I started in makeup at 6.30 in the morning. Um, the first year, some days I wasn't finished till eight and allowed to be out of makeup till eight or 10 at night. Um, this year we were a little more organized. So usually by five, I was out of makeup but that's still a very long day. Um, and it is a different set of skills. And um, so I would encourage people who wanna do this to learn something about the skills required to do this. One of the most wonderful things about it is that you are getting the opportunity to make an impact and educate a huge number of people in a way that I don't think you can get any anywhere else. And so for me, that was, one of the most valuable parts of it. Again, on the negative side, um, I think Silva touched on this a bit just now, but one of the things that it was important for me to think about was what happens to my personal life when I'm talking about these things in the media. Um, now, a lot of my personal orientation, things like that I've written about so people know, but um, this further restricted what I could do in community. And that has been a bit difficult. Uh, most contracts have a clause um, that says that you have to not do anything that would bring the company into disrepute. Now, one might think that if you're doing a show where there's active sex on the screen um, and where you're talking about non-monogamy and people are seeing more, more than two people getting together in, in sexual activity, that really that clause is not taken seriously but it can be and um so it's something that you have to be very careful about um and you also have to be careful about people really wanting to um gain some sort of notoriety off of things that they might say or do or expose about you it's a terrible thing to say, but it is true. And so it, it made me think um, again about what kinds of events I would go to, what I would need to feel safe in order to 
um, go to an event where I would be letting my hair down. So I already had the layer of that for making sure that my clients were going to be comfortable and I wasn't going to run into a client because it's a small community. Now I have another layer. Um, I was not prepared for people noticing me in places like the grocery store and um, getting my nails done. And unlike people who are um, actors, where people want to come and ask for a picture with you and your autograph, when people recognize me, they want to tell me their whole life story. So that is another thing that I think takes preparation and skill to be able to make people feel heard and yet not and, and, and set your boundary clearly um, so that you don't get overwhelmed and you do have some privacy, but um, you're also still representing well. Overall, it was a phenomenal experience, and I would encourage people who have the opportunity to consider doing something like this. But similar to Silva, I would say, please research what you're doing very carefully. I've, um, I've ended up with a lot of media work as a result of this um, writing and, and being interviewed in the press, and I'm quite happy to do it. But sometimes people do have an agenda, and um, you have no control over the editing. And so you need to be prepared to deal with being badly edited. Um, the film company that I was dealing with um, really tried to edit people well, everyone well, the couples, the um, residents, everybody involved well. Um, but I have also experienced situations where people don't. I had one interview with um, um, a large press outlet uh, where I was quoted out of context. Um, and it was that was actually the most upsetting for me because um, they suggested something that I firmly disagree with. Um, there's very little that you can do in that sort of situation to get things changed. So actually screening the people that you're dealing with first uh, or having a publicist who will do that for you is a very, very useful thing. From a therapeutic point of view, um, the opportunity to have an impact and educate and um, I guess most of all, for somebody who is queer identified and um, non-monogamous um, and also a practicer of kink and BDSM, to help somebody see that they are not strange, crazy, weird, the opportunity to do that on a large scale and to normalize what these categories look like is the reason that I did this and is the reason that I'll continue to do it. Um, having young people come and email me and say it's because of you that i felt okay about what i was thinking or feeling because i saw you i decided to go to therapy those sorts of things were the things that have really impacted me the most i did not expect that piece of work to have people at the end of it telling me that i had impacted their life their lives on a very deep level um, and that was the most positive result that was unexpected. I did expect to have an impact, but the level of impact was what was amazing for me. Um, I'm also happy to answer questions about how you do this, the pitfalls of doing this, the best ways to do this. I think we need far more representation. It was one of the criticisms I had about um, the first season of the show. The second season is a bit better, but that's the other part of this is that you don't get a lot of say. Um, so people would ask me, and colleagues would ask me, well, why, you know, why did you cast those people? I have nothing to do with casting. So um, it, that was another thing that was a little bit, um, well, more than a little bit annoying. Um, I have been heard to say to people, could you pick some people that actually have normal sized bodies, please? You know, that sort of thing. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Hmm? Thank you. We're going to need to wrap this up a little bit because we've got one more panelist. But thank you very much for your contributions there. Um, stay on and we'll see if we can get to, if there are some questions after Alexis has spoken to to the groups. Yes. OK. Or he's delaying me to copy it. Uh, so this isn't working, is it? Is it? Oh, you can. There we go. Great. Thank you. So hi, my name is or I am 
very junior in my experience as a, as a psychotherapist. Um, and I wrote the very colourful book, which is in front of some of you there, called Queer Up, an uplifting guide to LGBTQ plus love life and mental health. Ding! Well, thank you! Wow! That's a lovely reaction to it. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about publishing. Now, I will start by just saying I have the utmost respect for our colleagues who are brave enough and strong enough to throw themselves into TV work and like national promotion like that. I am not brave enough to do that. Um, and so for me, uh, a world where people can't see your face um, and they don't know who you are, and it's like a book or occasional um, podcasting, that works very well for me because it actually makes me feel a lot safer than anything like that. So hats off to you, but to you both. If you're in the campus meeting, thinking that sounds terrifying, consider publishing an audio because no one knows who you are. Um, okay, so I wrote Queer Up um, originally in 2019 because as we have all discussed this morning, we are aware that we are in a mental health crisis, despite what this government says. Um, and we ha so we have to think of how we can scale. And there are only so many hours that we can sit in our therapy rooms with our patients. And I'm very, very fortunate to work in a wonderful NHS clinic where I do get to do group therapy with MSMs, men who have sex with men, and then do one-to-one -one therapy with them. But that's really time limited. And as hard as we are all working, everyone's got a waiting list. And so we have to think about how we scale. And Queer Up was actually taking the ideas that we are using in the group therapy, which I work in, and also on the crisis line, because I'm a really fun person who volunteers on the crisis line in my free time. Because uh, when you do therapy for a job, nothing's more uplifting than talking about suicide and your time off. Um, and so it's actually about early intervention. So Brendan's work is wonderfully intellectual and academic and fantastic resource for everyone in this room. I'm going more for the like 12, 13, 14 year old market of making things accessible to them. And that's something which I think we need to consider more of how we do. So there's loads of stuff of actually how do we support people when they're in these crises modes? It's not enough, but there's quite a bit of it. Actually, how do we stop people getting there? Um, we're never going to do ourselves out of a job. People are always going to need a little checkup from the neck up. But actually, if we can start to lower some of those waiting lists by early intervention, and that's what Queer Up was all about. Now, I was set the challenge by the clinical director in, that I worked under, a brilliant woman called Sarah Kendrick um, at Shout. And it came because we had so many young queer people getting in touch on, with the crisis line with the same questions and the same fears that I was going through in the mid noughties, the same fears and questions that she was then experiencing in the eighties. And I kind of went to her, I was like, where are the positive, uplifting, non-scary resources, which I can send these young people? I can't find any. She went away and she also couldn't find any. And she came back and was like, well, you're a writer, off you go. Um, and I very much at first was like, I don't have, the experience, the expertise to do this. And one of the things which I learned in the process is that actually none of us should undersell our own expertise. And I think as therapists, what I've noticed in the time that I've been blessed in this profession is that so many of us really undersell our expertise. And we seem to be quite uncomfortable with saying, yeah, actually we do know our stuff. And there's this strange thing which has happened with mass media and, and especially with social media where people who actually aren't psychotherapeutically trained have worked out that talking about mental health is really lucrative and they've built really big careers for themselves so actually it's the opposite of what michael gove said all those years ago we need more experts please and you are all experts so i would really really encourage you to think about well how do i add to this conversation how do i scale my expertise i'm a firm believer in that everybody has a book within them. It might be a pamphlet, it might be a really big novel, but everybody has something to say and advocate for. And we all know the phrase, it's the, it's the relationship which heals. Actually, you can scale that by putting some of yourself into books, into podcasts, if you are brave enough, into TV and media work like these wonderful people. So how we do that is, a, is yeah, 
that is an opportunity to do that. So don't undersell, undersell your expertise. Think systemically. One of the marketing ploys, but quite deliberate strategic objectives of, of Queer Up was that, yes, our primary focus is on 12, 13 year old, 14 year old queer people, but actually there is a lot in there which is specifically written for parents and teachers because we're not giving their systemic networks and the structures around them safe places to learn and answer and find it and find the answers to those questions. So how do we also help those people as well? And that's one of the things which we do with Queer Up um, in there. So uh, I mean, this is also a strange situation where I am advocating for a bit of a, uh, a mixed message in the sense that I think as a profession, we need to shout about our expertise and upskill our expertise and then dismantle all of that and make it available to people. And I, but I actually, and I know that that sounds contradictory, but actually to me, that's the definition of an, of an expert because an expert makes a complicated thing seem simple. And I don't know about you, but a lot of patients that I work with, um, they come and they've read something like The Velvet Rage, which is a wonderful tome. It's quite outdated now. And then they, they think, oh, okay, I don't know how I apply that in my day-to-day -day life now. Or they read something like um, Straight Jacket, which again is a brilliant book, but it's also kind of terrifying. Um, and to that point about um, not about expertise, it's written by a fantastic journalist rather than someone who is a qualified mental health practitioner. And so I think we need to balance the narrative out there and the one way we can do that is getting more experts to write these things and make them accessible and less scary to people. And that point about things being less scary, it was very deliberate in the subtitle that we called it an uplifting guide because I think that mental health can be really scary. We know that there are bad statistics. We know that queer people of all ages face big, big issues. We don't talk enough about queer joy. And I think if we can get kids, all people, but particularly kids, exposed to queer joy, that's a really healing experience. So how actually we also change our narrative when we're talking about mental health to be a really empowering, positive, uplifting one, Another way I think we can do that other than writing is by living visibly as therapists. So I also am active on social media and you'll hear more about how to kind of like build a healthy social media presence in a moment. But one way I do that is I'm really clear about my page is not therapy. This is just me as a person. I am not a sage, wise, perfect person who has never made a mistake. I'm very, very, fallible, have made plenty of mistakes and will do again. And in my therapeutic work, I've found that that is actually helpful in starting to build a more equal relationship between me and my people that I work with. I don't mean that, that in the sense that I chat with them on social media, no. Um, just as we all kind of, when we start working with people, we say like, hi, if we were to bump into one another in a restaurant or something like that, I wouldn't acknowledge you. It's not me being rude. It's just me respecting your privacy. I acknowledge, yeah, you might see me on social media. That is not therapy, that is my life. I'm doing that because actually I do have a real life outside of this. I'm not perfect and I am just, this is just another relationship. If they can start to see us as human beings rather than wise counselors, I think that actually they will realize they can do these things more themselves as well. And we, again, we start to democratize and make all of this theory a lot more approachable and that's what I think we have to do uh, and I'm going to wrap up now so yeah cheers thank you um we are are there any comments or questions we could maybe take one or two in, I think we've still got Laurie Beth online you've got something there Kaz okay let's go to yours have we got a we'll get this mic over to you. No, uh, it's not on yet. Uh, Jim, can you turn that microphone back on? This is from Moran, and it's um, to basically anyone who, who'd like to answer it. Um, how would you navigate hate and anger from within the community? 
So obviously you talked about like trolls on the outside, but sometimes it's that fear of being cancelled that is as big and scary. Uh, yes. Uh, I think one of the things we have to understand about that is we have to reflect a bit on it. Do they have a valid point? Quite often there is a grain of sand there, which then unfortunately can then get wrapped up in some of their own discomfort, resentment, anger. And it's our job to kind of know how much of that we have to take on and how much of that, of that is not ours to take on. Um, ultimately, if we are happy with our behaviour, our values and what we have said and that and we believe we're in the right there, I think that has to be our, our shield because we cannot please everybody. And absolutely, I have had some people question, why is this person writing this? Well, I'm like, well, because that's what I wrote from that. You go and write the 102. I acknowledge mine is the 101 introduction. You go and write 102. You go and write, write, write 103. Allow people space. Um, like do my life. Yeah, yeah. You said yeah. so in a public facing job when someone comes up to you wants to tell you their lives. What, what does that boundary sound like? What does that exchange sound like? What's the optimum boundary sentence? So actually, um, I have made a business card um that has a Q um QR code on it that will take them to a way to actually have a private conversation with me. Takes them to an intro appointment, and I say. I really would like to give you my full attention, but I cannot in this surrounding, I'm concerned about your privacy. And here's a way to contact me, or thank you for approaching me. Um, here's a way to contact me where we can have the privacy that this conversation deserves.